Hello, my name's Hugh, this is Marshmallow, and we've got four in attendance as well. And today we're going to bring you all the drama of a hatch day, all the excitement, all the things that can and did go wrong, but ultimately we get a great result with Marshmallow and lots of chicks. Welcome to English Country Life, my name's Fiona and together with my husband Hugh we breed and raise Buff Orpington chickens. In this short series we're going to be showing you how we combine broody hens and artificial incubators, brooders and candlers to maximise our hatch sizes. Now Marshmallow, who's behind me with her chicks, was great at incubating. She clearly is very good at raising the chicks, but oh my goodness, the hatching process was absolutely awful. Now in the part one of this series, we stopped at candling the eggs. So let's show you actually what happened during that hatching process and why this equipment was so essential to make sure that she has this giant brood of very healthy chicks. So as Fiona said, we left the part one video and there'll be a link somewhere up here if you haven't already seen that, round about candling, which is one week into incubation. Chicken incubation is 21 days overall. And we found a wonderful problem. Thor, our stud cockerel, had done a brilliant job, but almost all of the eggs that we were incubating were fertile and viable, and that's not normal. So we left in a bit of a quandary. There were too many eggs for young marshmallow here to sit on and finish the incubation, and that's what we'd normally want to do. So we decided to continue incubating a proportion of the eggs in the incubator, because not every egg is going to hatch. So the theory goes, Marshmallow hatches as many as she could, we'll hatch the rest in the incubator, not all will hatch, and then we'll consolidate the chicks under Marshmallow just after they've hatched. That was the theory. Keep watching for what really happened. What we're at now is day 19. All we've done is a couple more candlings, removing any eggs that aren't developing, and we've worked as many eggs under Marshmallow as we possibly can that she can comfortably cover and continue to incubate. But we're left with seven eggs at day 19. So we're going to take off the lid of the incubator and we're going to prepare for hatching in the incubator. First thing is to remove all of the cradles in the incubator. You can't hatch an egg in a cradle, it needs space. So the cradle with the eggs in, we carefully remove. We're going to hatch seven in the incubator. We'll also take out the mechanism to turn the cradles. We don't need that anymore. Then we take the covers off the water trays, and that's because we're going to fit a hatching mat. It's a piece of corrugated cardboard that sits in the bottom of the incubator and gives a nice, soft, grippy surface for little chick's feet and for the eggs themselves. Once that's done, we're going to put those seven eggs back into the incubator, and that's the last time we're going to touch them until they hatch. They don't need turning anymore on days 20 and 21. The hatching process is going to be underway so we'll let them get on. So then it's lid on, but with the lid on, we need to change the settings. The first thing that we're gonna do is turn off the auto turn function. And the second thing is to increase humidity to 70% to keep it lovely and moist in the incubator to stop any membranes sticking to the chicks. Now this is what I want you to see. This is the EX model. And as soon as I've increased that humidity, you can see the little drips of water in the center at the top, dropping out and bulking up the humidity in the incubator. Here we are on the morning of day 21 and a lovely surprise first thing in the morning bottom left hand corner we've got a little chick that's hatched now the temptation is of course to take it out put it under the brood and let it fluff up but we mustn't 
Here it is a couple of hours later and you can see that next to it is a hatching egg and if we open the incubator the humidity will plummet, the membranes will shrink onto that hatching egg and any that have just picked will dry out and it really is going to hurt those that are still hatching. So we're just going to let this little fella bumble around on his own inside the incubator and keeping it nice and moist in there for the rest. And you can see this one. This hatched perfectly successfully, but look at the exhaustion on it. We've got to let them all fluff up, all be ready before we open the incubator. Now, a little bit later on, we're going to see that we've got five successful hatches, all nice and fluffed up all ready to be moved. So we're going to move them now. And the way we do that is, I'm afraid, a bucket of chicken. It may sound a little bit odd, but a bucket has lovely high sides. It's a great way to move chicks around. They can't jump out of it because of the nature. Obviously, we don't just dump them in a bucket. We gently lower them in onto a floor of wood shavings where they can sit comfortably while we move them to the breeder. And here they are, you can see, it's not quite as inhumane as I make it sound with a bucket of chicken, but they're very happy in there. And here is what we call the Special Care Chick Unit. It's got a Brinze Eco Glow Brooder in it, a little bit of chick crumb and a nice shallow drinker. And as we put the chicks in, they you can see that the back is right down, the front is quite up and the chicks can waddle in and find the level of warmth that they want under that brooder plate just to feel like they're under a hen and we're going to leave them in there till roost time and then we're going to pop them in with marshmallow. Of course while we were doing all of that with the incubator marshmallow has got eggs of her own and she's been fantastic at incubating them. You can see her hair building up a big nest bowl to keep those eggs safe and warm. And you'll hear her booming and clucking and talking to the chicks in the shell and they can hear and can respond. Here she is having a bit of a siesta during the day. And what you are going to see is me peeking in, checking that everything's okay. Now you'll see her rear up and fluff up and she's telling me to go away and all's okay. So I'm not going to touch her, but I just wanted to be sure that everything was proceeding as it should. And it's important to monitor. And I think you'll see why in a minute. Now a little bit later, look at the depth of that bowl and she's checking her eggs, turning them a little bit, making sure that everything's proceeding as it should. And it was at this stage, Everything was absolutely fine. She's still doing an absolutely brilliant job moving those eggs around. Now, here she is looking and pecking. And if you wait just a moment, you'll see a little face come out and respond to her. And one of the things with brood is you don't always know what's hatched underneath them. They're not transparent like an incubator. And here's a little chick that obviously hatched a few hours before at least. Then we came to a bit of a problem because you can see how mature that chick was and some of the others and marshmallow wants to lead them out and get them something to eat and drink but there's chicks still hatching there are chicks calling for her that are partially hatched there are eggs pipping and she's becoming quite distressed with almost not knowing what to do does she look after the chicks that are fluffed up or the ones that are hatching and at this stage i decided to intervene so what you're going to see now is my arm picking up those chicks that are either partially hatched, pipped or still in the shell. And we're going to move those into an incubator to finish the process of hatching and allow Marshmallow to focus her energies on those chicks that have already hatched successfully, that are fluffed up. And she wants to give some attention and some food and some drink to now you'll see her being quite distressed but within seconds of us removing those she settled down with the mature chicks that are giving her a hard time because they're not quite sure what's food and what's mum at this stage but what they do know is what's warm and where to burrow in and keep themselves for it. The other chicks they hatch quite successfully and that evening Fiona returned them to Marshmallow as Marshmallow is just starting to settle down for the night popping them under a wing although that one wanted to go for a run and we have never had any problems with returning chicks to our broodies because their instincts are so strong.
before we move on, I really wanted to show you a little bit more about Marshmallow because I feel like I've shown you an environment that says incubators are great at hatching chicks, broody hens can have problems, therefore hatch with incubators. And that's so far from the truth. Most broody hens don't have a problem like Marshmallow had, but look at her. Look at her leading those chicks around. And look at them at this little tiny, in amongst Thor, who's a four and a half kilo cockerel. They're absolutely well adjusted to the flock. They're drinking away. They know where to go for a drink. And she's there to protect them and show them how to live. Part of that living is how to interact with people and chickens, but also things like here. If you look at her closely, she's not eating. She's picking out little bits of food and giving it to the chicks. This is a better example. Look here. She's actually catching insects on a cherry tree and feeding them to her chicks, showing them what food is and where to find it. And look at them rush to her. They know how to learn from marshmallow. And this is why we like broody hens. Now here I've got some sympathy. And I'm sure any of you that are parents will have sympathy for marshmallow here. She's trying to have a sand bath and, you know, she gets no peace at all. But look at the chick to her left, already copying her a day or two old. That chick is learning from mum. Sure, some of them are treating her as a climbing frame. And sure, she will make her own sand bars in a bit of dry earth, as is a natural behaviour, as is catching those insects. So she doesn't need us to provide all these things for her. She would do it quite naturally. And this is part of Look at this. These chicks are out on a colder day. And you can see three or four of them, but they're staying close. And a lot of the rest are under marshmallow keeping warm. They don't need a brood plate now. Marshmallow's doing all of that for them. And those chicks can interact from a very young age, but only because they've got a broody. So let me summarise a little bit about the process that we went through to try and explain why we do what we do. To start with, because Marshmallow is an inexperienced hen, we only put six eggs under because there's quite a possibility that she could wander off at some point, the eggs could chill and not remain viable. But by starting some in the incubator as well, in the unlikely event that that happens, we've got backup eggs that we can swap out the eggs under her that have chilled. Next step, of course, is candling. And at candling, we know that some of the eggs will be developing and some will not. And again, having some in the incubator, some under marshmallow, meant that we could remove any that weren't developing, consolidate the eggs, but still have a good, strong clutch. Now, on this occasion, young Thor here had done his job incredibly well, and most of the eggs were viable. But when you buy eggs through the post that have been jostled, etc., that's not always the case. And having extra eggs to consolidate down can be really, really helpful. After that, obviously, we ended up with so many eggs that marshmallows still couldn't cover them all. So we hatched some in the incubator and some under marshmallow. Not every egg's going to hatch. So having some in both places means, again, we can hatch some in the incubator, fluff them up in the brood, again, strong and happy and healthy. And that evening, pop them under marshmallow's wing. She really wouldn't notice and she didn't notice. And she ends up with a good, strong clutch. Lastly, of course, you can get disasters on hatch day. The hen can have a prolonged hatch period and she might feel the need to take the chicks that have hatched out and feed them, meaning that the remainder are not getting the warmth they need to continue to hatch. And in that environment, or in any environment where she doesn't hatch well, you can scoop up the eggs during hatch day, pop them in the incubator and finish off the hatch and still end up with a viable clutch. So the combination of candler, brooder and incubator, even if you're using broody hens, can really increase the quality of your outcomes. Let's have a look next at the equipment that we used and what we think of it. Well, with Marshmallow in the background, let me tell you a little bit about the equipment we used and why we think it's necessary. So we used the Brinsley Ovation 28EX. That's the sort of top of the range model of the 28 size incubator that Brinsley did. We already own a 28 Advance. So we're big fans of the Brinsay incubators. They've lent us the EX model for this year and it's been fantastic. We think a 28 is a good size for people like us that are trying to be sort of self-sufficient, produce their own birds. We know other small holders who will produce say 56 eggs at a time, so they need a 56 size model. 
obviously if you're breeding commercially brins they do incubators that go up into the hundreds and if you just want a few backyard hens they've got some models that will do seven or 12 eggs at a time that sort of size so there is a size always for you but things that matter for me are how you're going to turn them are you really going to remember to turn those eggs several times a day by hand i think an auto turner is great i think an automatic thermostat is a must-have and whilst in the past i liked to have a humidity monitor but i adjusted sliders over water trays myself to manage the level of humidity the ex has convinced me that having actually a humidity pump really makes the process a great deal easier I think we've shown that the candler, again, to increase your brood size, to monitor what's viable and what's not, is really handy. And I think having a brooder is also tremendously helpful. If you do have to rescue any chicks from under a broody hen during the hatch process, or if you're hatching in an incubator, then the brooder's pretty much got to be there to provide that warm, safe space for the chicks to fluff up before going back to the broody. And obviously, if you're entirely hatching in an incubator, it's a must-have bit of setup. The Brinzier kit has been fabulous throughout. We've had no problems with it, and we strongly recommend it. Well, that's our summary of Marshmallow's journey and Marshmallow has been a little star. She's got 12 happy healthy chicks that she's bringing up that she's happy to sit with us to show to the world and to educate to teach them what to eat to keep them safe and we think that chicks raised by broody hens really do have an advantage that they're well socialized they don't see humans as a threat they just see us as part of their life and they're happy to be around us and we like that with our chicks if you've enjoyed today's episode can you spare us five seconds give us a thumbs up down below if you'd like to know more about the way that we raise our chickens or any other aspect of our small holding life let us know in the comments down there and we'll get back to you as soon as possible maybe even make a video about it if you'd like to see those videos and everything else that we produce click on subscribe down there hit the bell next to it you'll hear every time we upload a new video but for now thanks for watching come back and see us soon take care